<laughs> so uh, I'm gonna. Well, so last but not least, uh, we're gonna have our last uh, keynote of, of the day by Gautam Prabhu, uh, VP Engineering at, at Zendesk. So he's uh, one of our newest mentors this week. So it's the community is growing every day. Uh, so you were uh, you're currently VP Engineering at Zendesk, and you started in 2011 as Director of Engineering. Now, as you can see, your your talk has actually inspired uh, the name of the whole event. And uh, so, being one of those exceptional leaders, uh, we're very glad to have you with us today. So, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Sean, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> Should have gone with the uh, just straight t-shirt. <laughs> so, um, thank you guys for having me. Just some quick background. Um, so, I work for Zendesk. We build a suite of business productivity applications. The flagship one is a help desk product. Um, my role there is the VP of engineering for shared services. So I mentioned we have a suite of applications. The shared infrastructure that underpins all of those is my responsibility. Um, prior to Zendesk, I was at a, well, actually I first joined Zendesk as a director of engineering on feature development. Um, so full stack development, but user facing parts of the application. Um, and before Zendesk, I was the VP of engineering at a much smaller company called Power Reviews. Um, and at Power Reviews, that was actually where I got my first experience as an, you know, as an engineering manager at all. Um, and I went straight from IC to VP of engineering, and I, I got that for probably the two best reasons I can think of. Um, I was the first person there, and no one else would do it. So, <laughs> you know, th those are actually terrible reasons, but they're, they're, not, act they're not that uncommon. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty grateful for it um, because I found that I really liked it and I've sort of been on that management leadership track ever since and that's now going on 12 years. So I think because of my Zen experience, Kwong asked me to talk about the traits of exceptional engineering leaders. Um, and so I, I'm gonna start by, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start answering this question by revealing some biases which I actually think have been supported by a lot of the speakers tonight so I'm, I'm very happy for that. Um, but some people who I, I don't you know, think are provably wrong, can think of engineering management or engineering leadership as science, and it's something you can be taught very carefully, you can learn um, from someone else by almost studying. It's possible, for, for me, my experience has been that engineering, science, uh, engineering leadership is more of a craft. Um, and what that implies to me is that there's more than one way to do it, there's lots of solutions to these problems, um, and so it, it's a much more you know, generic problem than, than one would think. So, so part of me, when, when someone says, what are the traits of exceptional engineering leaders, when they come to me and say that, I, I almost want to answer them the same way I answer my kids anytime they answer me, ask me a question, which is like, I feel like you should figure this out on your own. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm, I'm joking. I do answer my kids' questions, at least 20, 25% of them. Um, and, I, and I did brainstorm about this one. Um, I brainstormed some traits that I think are really, really sort of common recurring patterns I've seen in engineering leaders. And actually, I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget. Uh, so I do have a list. But in the process of coming up with this list, like one of the things I realized is this list is huge. This list is huge. Um, there is frankly no one on earth or no one I've met who exhibits all of these characteristics. And the fact is leadership is situational. Like there's a different sort of set of characteristics you want in a different situation. And the advice I would give someone on what are the traits of an exceptional engineering leader at a five-person startup, you know, I talked to someone today who's in this, in the, that exact boat, might be very different from the advice I would give to someone who's at a, you know, 10,000-person uh, company. So, that doesn't mean the question is useless. It's actually a very important question. And as I started brainstorming, and I realized that it's almost more important to ask the question and try to answer the question than to come up with the answer to the question itself. Um, so, so why is that? The first reason is for you. You know, a lot of you here are up-and-coming engineering leaders. And one of the things that's really important is to start thinking about what you think are traits of you know, good engineering leaders that you've met, or maybe traits that you, you haven't seen before but you wish that you know, your, your engineering managers had had. Um, and it gives you a good way to sort of pattern match against where am I strong, how do I play to those strengths, uh, and where am I weak, and I need to fill that in, or maybe I should avoid roles that require that. So, so part of it is personal. Um, the second thing is we talked about, you know, the, the previous panel talked about how to identify who to promote to engineering management. Um, so feeling like you have a really, you know, solid classification system for identifying those people is really important. Or, or making sure that you can actually classify and, you know, correctly evaluate, you know, outsiders who are coming in to join that system. Um, 
when you promote someone to these positions of responsibility, you know, bo both technical or, or managerial, which I'll get to a little bit later, you know, that's a lot of responsibility you're giving them, um, and they're giving it a lot of, you're giving them a lot of opportunity to make an impact, and that impact can be both positive or negative. So feeling like you have a good system for identifying your internal leaders or you know, correctly vetting external people who are coming in, whether they'll be the right fit, is super important. Um, it's super important to growing your team and to actually improving your product. Um, we talked a lot before, which I'm really happy about, about the difference between a technical track and a managerial track. Um, one of the things we've realized at Zendesk, um, which I'll get to in more detail later, is that leadership is, is a, you know, a two-track thing for us as well as a lot of you. Um, so when we talk about traits of exceptional engineering leaders, we're not just talking about traits of exceptional engineering managers. There's actually a requirement for leadership that comes with the technical track as well. It's not just I'm the greatest coder, and we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but so that's an important, that's a growing importance, you know, in companies that I see where they've split these tracks and there's actually leadership requirements on both sides. Um, the last thing is, as I started answering the question of what makes a great engineering leader, it's inseparable from, for me, from the question of what makes a great engineering team. I don't think you can say, is this person a, a great, a great leader without saying, are they running a great team or they are, are they taking a great team, uh, taking a team from, you know, not good or not exceptional to exceptional. So in my mind, you get a twofer. You know, if you're answering this question, you're actually ask, answering the question of like, what does a healthy team look like? And for all of you, that's gonna be a super valuable experience. At some point, you're gonna be dropped in without context um, to a situation where you have to evaluate the health of a team and you should have those sort of like, you know, benchmarks that can let you quickly make your own, you know, decision based on, you know, your gut instinct and your experience. So let me, let me just talk about how Zendesk thinks about this and how we got there. So when I, when I first got to Zendesk, I was um, dealt, I was dealing with a problem that's probably pretty familiar to many of you, which is the monolithic one big team problem. So everyone was reporting to me, um, and the team was very project-based. So that had a lot of problems. Um, one of them being that in a project-based system, like it's hard to actually have an opportunity to demonstrate leadership. You know, if you're an engineer, and you're working on something different every month or in some pathological cases every week or every day based on like business you know, priority shifting at a small startup, it's hard to actually have that opportunity to like stick with something and show that you've you know, demonstrated that leadership, be it managerial, be it technical, organizational. Um, but Zendus was small, our ambitions were sort of constrained at the time, so that worked for us you know, until it didn't. And one day I kind of looked up and you know, the 15 person team had turned into 30 people all reporting directly to me and that was a mess. It was a mess for a variety of reasons. It was a mess for me, but it was also a mess for the people who actually had that leadership potential in them who weren't being given the opportunity to show it. So our next step was to take that team and decompose it into subteams. Um, and each subteam was given two things. The, the first thing they were given was a mandate. So let's get away from this project-based mentality and let's go to an ownership-based mentality. Instead of here's what you're working on today, it's, or here's your next thing you have to do, it's here's a portfolio of things that you own. Um, and you'll stick with them. And that thing could be a feature. It could be a back-end service. It could be an entire product based on you know, how the team was constructed. Um, and the second thing they were given was what I had called a, a tech lead. So this was my first time doing this. So I created the concept of a tech lead. A tech lead was a hybrid of an engineering manager as well as a senior technical resource. Uh, I think we've talked about reasons why that's a bad idea today. And I think eventually it does become a bad idea. Um, it worked for us for a while, though. You know, and in going from 30 to 300 engineers, at some point it stopped working. Um, and we then created the, the structure we have today, which sounds like it's um, pretty similar to what I've heard from a, a lot of the panelists, which is this split track. Today at Zendesk, you choose between uh, what we call a team lead route, which means you're going down a management track on the way to VP of engineering, or a dev lead, dev lead route, which is going down the path towards you know, our CTO, in theory. Um, and so that has really crystallized a lot of things for us. The first thing is it made our problem twice as hard in terms of identifying leaders. We now need to identify management leaders as well as technical leaders. Um, and so I, I think this question of what are the traits of those great engineering leaders becomes even more important. So I'll, I'll talk through uh, some of them that I've seen. Um, I'm going to talk about the ones that I think are overlapping. So I think these apply both equally to what we consider our management leaders as well as our technical leaders. I think there are some divergent traits, um, but in the interest of time, you know, there's a lot of them. I, uh, I'm happy to talk to people individually about what I think are like the div divergent traits. But let me focus on the big ones. 
Um, and again, this is not a this is not a complete list. So about ten years ago, someone told me something which I'm sure many of you have heard, um, and it probably will seem obvious, but it really sort of impacted me about what are the traits of great engineering leaders. And this person, she told me that there were only two things, um, and those two things are your engineering leaders should make good decisions and they should like working with people. And, and I think that's actually applicable to engineering leaders or leaders anywhere. So let, let's start with what it means to make good decisions. I don't think anyone should be expecting perfect decisions. Uh, I think the way that I define that is given the information you have, which might be very limited or it might be, it might be pretty close to complete, is this person making decisions that lead to successful outcomes? You know, do they do the best with the information they have and do they tend to have more successful outcomes given the level of information that they start with? Um, and the second thing is to like working with people. So on the management track, I think this is almost beyond needing an explanation. Um, on the technical track, I think we're getting there, that it's probably becoming just accepted. And, and in one of the clips from one of the previous Plato events, someone said that, She'd fired more people for being the brilliant jerk than for underperforming, and I thought that was pretty apt. Um, I think every day the stereotype of the brilliant jerk or the genius in the corner being like a real building block for your team, like we get more and more away from that every day. Like I've seen that development is much more of a team exercise today than it was 20 years ago, and I think it's only going and trending in that direction. So regardless of which track you're on, if you don't really if, if um, you don't enjoy working with other people, whether that's inside engineering or outside engineering, all of those interactions are gonna drain you a little bit. Um, and at some point, if every activity that you do as part of your job is draining you, you're not gonna be successful at that. So you really have to enjoy it. You have to enjoy sort of interacting with other people. So I think those are the generic ones. Um, there's a few more specific ones that I've brainstormed. Um, and I'm sort of pattern, patterning this on people that I've sort of raised it Time to cut it off? Okay. That's a great thought, though. Very quickly. Thank you. I like the way you think. That's the trait of a great engineering leader, supporting me up on this stage. Uh, uh, all right, listen. Uh, really quickly, I'll run through a few. I love people who run to a fire rather than away from it. You know, during production incidents, it sucks. Your customers are unhappy. Your engineering team is unhappy. The one good thing, in my mind, is that it's an opportunity to look at who's responding to that who's responding to something that's outside of their swim lane and actually jumping in, almost being nosy. Like, what is the problem? It might not be my problem, how can I help? Um, I'll get, skip the next one. The last two I wanna talk about are, uh, I think a great engineering leader more and more is able to deal with ambiguous situations. Like, I've seen my career, um, I've confirmed this with peers, I, I've actually imposed this on people who work for me. As you get more and more responsibility, your expectation is to be able to deal with more and more vague problems and at some point, you find that you're not actually even being given a problem or a goal, you're asked to define both. You're defining both the problem and the solution. Um, and that can be somewhat scary, but it can also be exhilarating. Um, and I think, I think solving the question of like, how do you deal with ambiguous situations is, um, is sort of answered by my last trait, which is I think self-reflection. One of the things that I've found very useful uh, in my career is, you know, twice a year Zendus does these performance reviews. They're terrible, I'm terrible at it. I was hoping there'd be a Play-Doh session on like how to do good, good performance reviews. And if there is, you know, I'd prefer to be the, on the mentee side rather than the mentor, just to be completely <laughs> frank. But I treat it as an opportunity to look back at my philosophies on what makes a healthy team, what makes a healthy engineering leader and see if I want to course correct on that. Usually it's nothing dramatic, but there's something small usually every single time, which I remove from my list, add to my list, clarify a little bit. Um, and that process of self-reflection is really, really useful for me because I think it helps me deal with these ambiguous situations. You know, you're gonna all be deal dealing with this as you go up in responsibility where the problems given to you are more and more vague and hopefully you have a mentor there, you know, whether it's from Plato or at your work or someone in your network who can help guide you and advise you. Um, if that person is not there though, I'm here to tell you that you can teach yourself to fish and that is via a process of self-reflection and constantly sort of like improving yourself based on the experiences you've had. Um, and hopefully that gives you the confidence to pretty much deal with any situation you have in your career. Um, that's where, where I feel I am today. Uh, certainly not perfect, but I know that like every experience I have is making me a little bit better by this process of self-reflection. Um, so with that, thank you, Kwong, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I think I'm done.
Okay, what are the practical skills that one should work on to make the jump from engineering manager to director and VP? Well, again, this depends. <laughs> you know, director, director is not the same everywhere. VP is not the same everywhere. I told you I was a VP of engineering at uh, my previous company, and that meant I started off running a one-person team, and then by the end, maybe it was 20. Um, that's very different from what I'm doing right now. So I would say let, let's not focus on engineering manager to director and VP. Let's take the titles out of it. Like, I think that puts some sort of like really, really crisp assumption that the title carries some clear responsibilities, and it doesn't. Um, maybe within a company it does, but between companies it's not a portable, it's not a portable title, I would say. I would say that the goal of moving up the management track, I'll just focus on the management track from here on out. The goal of moving up the management track is that you should be able to take on an increasing amount of autonomy. You should be given more and more of, you know, ambiguous problems, ambiguous challenges, and more autonomy to sort of deal with them. So I think that's really the biggest thing for me, is when given a problem, like how much authority do you have to solve that? How much autonomy do you have to solve that? Um, so that, that is growth on the management track in general. So from engineering manager to director or VP, you should be just solving a bigger problem with less guidance than you were before. And you should be you know, sort of dictating more and more of the solution. How do we lead for diversity and inclu in inclusion? What can we do as individuals? You know, so this is a tricky one. Um, I think one of the things that Zendesk has done is we have, a, we have actually someone who's in charge of diversity and inclusion. Um, and one of the expectations is that everyone in engineering partners up with them. And we're fortunate. Like our head of diversity and inclusion actually can point us in the right direction. You know, some of us are sort of like, you know, blind people with a gun being asked, like, help me point in the right direction. And we have that, we have that advantage in that we have a you know, head of diversity and inclusion who can help us do that. They can connect us with the right groups, with the right boot camps. Um, so I, I guess I'm fortunate in that I have that. Without, without that, I, I think my, if, if I were in charge of that without any resources to help me, my, my goal would be what, the way I approach most problems, which is like a really personal sort of start. You know, I guess I, as VP of engineering, would be looking for what are the groups that I can go learn about? What are the groups I can go attend? Um, what are the college hiring programs I can go, you know, get involved with? What are the boot camps I can get involved with? And I would try to make that a personal presence. You know, we've done some hiring from, you know, boot camps that have, you know, diversity angles to them. And they have these awesome hiring days, for example. You can go and you can meet 30 people in about one hour, maybe two hours. Um, and it's a good way to get your you know, face out in the community to learn about you know, who the candidates are and to connect with some of them. Uh, I wish I had a better answer for you than that, but, but that's, that would be my approach if we didn't have you know, that, that problem sort of not taken care of, but uh, you know, re we have someone who's responsible for that, Zendesk, who we partner with. Thank you so much. It was a great talk. Thank you so, so much. So um, the Playtoy event number three is over, almost, because there's still a lot of cocktails. <laughs> and so uh, this mission is not over. We are, um, thank you. The, so they were here today. They were here tonight. But actually, the mentors are here every week. Every week, every single week, they connect to Plato mentor uh, system. And they help others, other, they help all the people, all the engineering managers. So thank you again. None of this would have been possible without you. So thank you and see you, see you soon. <laughs>